1935, the psychologist Donald Lard began researching the human sense of smell, which was interesting because at that time, the scientists of the day really weren't interested in our ability to smell. You see, those scientists have really been influenced by Charles Darwin and his thoughts about evolution. And Darwin thought, if you looked at the animal kingdom, people, we really don't have a strong sense of smell if you compare us to a lot of animals. If any of you have dogs, they seem to be able to smell a crumb that we can't even see on the floor. So many animals out in the wild, squirrels, mice, cats, they're able to use their sense of smell as a primary tool for finding food and maintaining survival. But as humans, we're not really like that. We rely a lot more on our vision, our ability to see things, to be able to see other people and their facial expressions and body language and work together. Darwin thought we were a lot more dependent on our sense of touch our ability to, to build tools and create structures. And he really thought that the human sense of smell was relatively unimportant to us. But our psychologist was not a scientist. He spent most of his day talking to other people and hearing stories. And he realized that the sense of smell that people have is really important. One day he was talking to a gentleman who had lost his father, and this man, when he was a young boy, his dad and his uncles worked in a sawmill. And as this man grieved the loss of his father and tried to find ways to remember him, he could look at pictures, he could try to just sit and bring memories of his dad into his mind to honor him. But he found that the most important the most significant, the easiest way, the most powerful way for him to remember his dad was smelling sawdust. Anytime this man smelled sawdust, he had these flashbacks, these images of his dad and his uncles in his mind that were more powerful than if he just sat and thought about them. In fact, those images were more powerful than looking at an actual picture of his dad. And then, of course, the emotions that came along with that. That sawdust reminded him of the hard work that his dad had done to always provide for their family. It reminded him of the joy of his dad coming home from work so that they could spend time together and play games and do all of those things. Our psychologists also found that for people who had experienced trauma, perhaps combat veterans, that for some reason, a person's sense of smell was one of the strongest triggers for what we now call post-traumatic stress disorder. So a combat veteran might have memories that they could bring about, they might have sounds that they could hear, but if they smelled burning diesel or if they smelled gunpowder, it could cause a flashback, a, a traumatic flashback in a way that no other sense could. And people didn't really understand why that was until modern medicine gave us kind of the imaging, the MRIs that we have today and the CT scans, and it revealed why. Just take our, our sense of touch, for example. If I touch this stand, even though it seems very quick to me that I can feel the cool metal here, from a biological sense, it takes a while for my skin to pick up that and travel all the way up my nerves into my brain and for my brain to process that sense of touch. But our nose is very different. Our nose is almost directly con, um, connected to our olfactory cortex in our brain, which is right at the front of our brain. And consequently, our olfactory cortex is right next to the brain centers that control emotion and memory. So when you smell something and it goes in your nose, it almost immediately reaches your brain and then immediately cascades into those memory and emotion centers of the brain, which is why the sense of smell can elicit such a powerful response in people. So even though our sense of smell isn't as powerful as other animals, it is crucial 
to who we are. There's some fascinating research going on now about how we can utilize, how we can harness the sense of smell to help people. For combat veterans, they've found that if they take a smell, a comforting smell like lavender, and they begin to mix it in with some of those triggering smells, that they can create a sense of safety and kind of desensitize the stress response. Some scientists have also found that years before people start showing the cognitive decline that we see with Alzheimer's, for some reason, they become less and less able to detect smells that once would have elicited some kind of emotion or memory. And the scientists really aren't sure what's going on, but definitely an avenue of research to assist people. Now, you might be wondering, why are we spending all of this time talking about the human sense of smell and brain structures? Well, it's because for the past several weeks, as I mentioned in the children's sermon, we've kind of been camped in John chapter 6. And some of the lectionary passages are actually quite repetitive, but the main image that's talked about over and over again is this image of bread. Bread as this incredible foundation of the Christian faith, the place where we get to meet the very presence of God. But what Jesus does with this bread is really quite masterful. If you go back several weeks, probably back into July, we, we read the first part of John 6 where there's a group of people who come to Jesus to hear him teach. There's probably true followers, people who are just kind of interested, maybe people who are adversarial to him. But he performs this miracle of multiplying loaves of bread so that he can feed the people who come to hear him. If you remember Maslow's first kind of base pyramid of need, right, is biological safety, sustenance, food. And Jesus appeals to that basic survival instinct of the people around him, seeming to say it's true that God and God's creation provides sustenance for us, for our physical bodies. And it didn't matter what nation the person was from, their gender, their spiritual orientation or religious affiliation. All of us can understand what it means to be hungry and to smell a loaf of bread and what that feels like. It would have appealed to Jesus' audience no matter who they were, no matter how they felt about Jesus. And in that way, I think Jesus kind of tries to hook people, get them interested. But then he withdraws. He, he leaves that area and kind of sees what people follow after him, who, who will persevere and continue to try to learn from him. And he begins to share a more difficult teaching. This idea that I can provide you with these physical loaves of bread that will satiate your hunger, that will sustain life, but there's a more important reality behind this teaching. And that's where he goes into this image of, I am the bread of life, and only those who the Father draw to me to eat of my body will have true life, eternal life. It really is amazing to me that when I think about it, in so many ways, God meets us in extraordinary ways through very ordinary but very familiar things to us. I talked about the idea of that bread. We all know what it's like to walk into a bakery hungry or to be working on baking bread in our own home or a neighbor's home and to smell that and engage in that. And God meets us in, in really sacred ways in that experience. And it's also true that for those who were blessed to actually meet Jesus in person, they got to meet God's self, but in a very ordinary human body. And it makes me wonder what other ways God might meet us in the ordinary and make the ordinary extraordinary. For those of us who gather every Sunday to share in this bread, to experience the presence of Christ in the bread, 
and to receive that nourishment, what other ways can we look to see God nourishing us in our lives? I didn't think about it back then, but now that I can remember sitting with my grandmother in the kitchen learning to cook, I see God's fingerprints all over that. And it's a very, it's a very real experience for me. And I imagine that many of you, if you have time this week to think about those family traditions or hobbies that you have, you know, the mentors that taught you how to woodwork or whatever it is that you enjoy doing, that maybe God's fingerprints are all over those things as well. This summer, about 20 people came to Austin campus to do a small group on a book called Everyday Spirituality by an ELCA bishop um, named Jim Hazelwood. And Bishop Jim's main point was exactly that, that God does meet us in the ordinary and the everyday, most essentially in the bread and the wine, but in so many other things too. And I really loved hearing how different members of Epiphany experience God on a, on a daily, in a daily way, whether it's through writing in a journal, sitting in traffic and listening to music, exercising, that God has a way of sanctifying the things that are very connected to us. You know, watching grandchildren nurturing children, creating friendships and community, navigating difficulties. God is present in all of those things, nourishing us, loving us, if only we pay attention. I wanted to share this morning a couple experiences that I've had in Epiphany, reasons that I appreciate being a part of Epiphany. I think Katrina and I have been members here for a little over three years, and every year we uh, participate in the Adopt a Family for Christmas. I don't know how many of you have done that, but I really encourage you to do so if you haven't. It's an experience to go out with my wife and my kids and to buy presents for a family who's in need. But the real spiritual value for me is the time when I go into Far Hills in that big auditorium and I see so many tables laid out with gifts and food for families in need. And it really does make me pause and think from sharing such a simple meal together, so much love and nurturing flows out from our practice of gathering on Sunday. It, it really is quite special. Talking to my wife, I've, um, you know, I didn't grow up going to church. And it's a very cool thing for me to see the young people and the high schoolers and the middle schoolers and even the younger kids here at Epiphany. I, I didn't have that kind of community when I was growing up. And... It's very striking to me. I remember one of our youth in a video recalling that when she was in middle school, one of the high schoolers sat down with her and was really interested in her life and wanted to hear what was going on and share life together and how that inspired that middle schooler when she was a high schooler to then pour into the lives of other young people who were coming after her. And that's, that's pretty cool. That's pretty special. I mean, God is in that. It's cool to watch so many people be so open to our younger members, to be interested in them, to want to invest themselves in the lives of, of other people, and vice versa. It's a two-way street. In a couple Saturdays, we'll have that event of the youth joined together with the Epiphany Quilters and doing something so simple as making some blankets. You imagine the tactile sense of the warm quilts, the soft quilts, but it can represent so much more if we reflect on it. As those who share in this meal and receive God's nourishment, we then gather together to continue sharing that warmth, that nurturing with people in our community. 
So I guess my encouragement to us this morning is for us to find ways to remember that God is so present in our lives, not just in this meal, most of all in this meal, but it extends to so much more. God is in the details of our lives, and for, for a real reason, God wants to connect with us, to share those personal memories with us, and for us to share love with others. Amen.